garden. And today, our virtual class is all about butterflies. We are going to learn what makes an animal a butterfly, the difference between butterflies and moths, how butterflies grow up, all about the amazing migrations of monarch butterflies, some things you can do to help butterflies, and we're going to play two cool butterfly games, as well as see a few activities that you can try out to learn about butterflies at home. The garden is open again with social distancing, but we hope you'll come visit us. And I hope you'll chime in in the comments with any questions or ideas or comments that you have during the class today. So, what are butterflies? Butterflies are a group of insects. They're in the group Lepidoptera, that means the group that butterflies and moths are in is together. And butterflies and moths are the only insects that have scales on their wings. So I'm going to place this over there. And you can see a close-up of the butterfly's wing. And if you could get it under a magnifying glass or really close under a microscope, you could see tiny little scales on the wings. Sometimes if you touch butterfly wings that have fallen off, you might see a little dust that comes off on your hand. That's actually the tiny scales coming off the wings. You never want to touch the wings on a live butterfly because those scales can be easily damaged and the butterfly needs them to fly. Because butterflies are insects, they do have all the regular parts of an insect. They have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have antenna, which let them kind of smell and sense around the world. They have two pairs of wings. These are actually separate. They have six legs. Spiders, you know, have eight legs. They're not an insect. If you watched our class about insects, you might have noticed that insects have different mouth parts. We actually acted some of those out. Well, the one that is butterflies and moths is called a proboscis. And it's kind of like a big curled up straw that they can uncurl and suck the nectar out of flowers. I also put a dragonfly up here so you can see the difference their wings don't have scales. They're more of a translucent look. There are actually 17,500 different species of butterflies in the world and 750 different species just in the US. So that's pretty amazing. Some of the different kinds of butterflies that you might be able to see in North Carolina include the Eastern Hair Street. The Viceroy, the Red Spotted Purple, as well as a lot of skippers. One interesting thing to note is that there are different groups of butterflies. Skippers are very small and have a lot of the features of moths. They look furry. And their wings meet in sort of an L shape, with one going out to the side, like that one. When they're stopped, their wings are up together. Whereas, when most butterflies are stopped, you'll see them flatten their wings sometimes. Swallowtails are the group who have a long tail on the bottom, and they tend to be big and colorful. Some of the prettiest butterflies that we like to look at. You can print these two guides for free, the Butterfly Guide and the Moth Guide next to it, from the North Carolina State Parks website for the Year of the Butterfly. They made one of the cool activities we're going to play later. Butterflies are a little bit different than moths. Typically, moths, like this luna moth, are active at night. They may have duller colors, but not always. And some butterflies can be active at night too, so that's not for sure. Moths can be fuzzier, but that's also not for sure. One of the biggest differences between them is that moth antenna look more feathery, whereas butterfly antenna look more like tiny little gloves. You can see that really well on the moth. For comparison, you can see those big feathery antennas. If you want to see some moths at home, you can check out our book for 200 plus ways to explore nature in home or backyard. And it has ideas for how you can actually lure moths uh, using a black light, using a moth bait that you can mix up in your own kitchen, and using light. So that's pretty fun. I'll put that in the So let's go on to our next question. How do butterflies grow up? Well, it's a really interesting story, and it's an incredible tale of transformation that inspires humans, actually, to think about how much we can change and the amazing ways that things can change. This is an egg. 
That's where butterflies start. They're often laid on leaves or pieces of grass. They're very, very tiny. This is a blown up picture, bigger than in real life. From that egg, the caterpillar hatches. Caterpillars need to eat a lot. They're growing very rapidly. They'll molt at least four times as they're growing up. One thing that sometimes confuses people is that they know insects have six legs, but caterpillars look like they have more than six. That's because caterpillars have true legs, and then they have some little pro legs, kind of like baby legs, that they have for a while, but they'll lose when they become a, cater when they become a butterfly. Then butterflies go into their chrysalis, and this is a case in which they're going to transform. I have a couple of models of different chrysalises here. You can also see two real chrysalises that we found in the garden here. We get a lot of butterflies here in the garden. If you have a chance, you can come check out our pollinator stroll to see some butterflies for yourself. How butterflies transform within the chrysalis is really incredible. Their body actually has to digest a lot of itself, but some bits of the nervous system and muscles still, still remain. But if you were to poke a chrysalis, and you should never do this. But if you were to do it at just the right point in their cycle, a goo would actually come out. And that goo is full of protein. And that's what the caterpillar's body has broken down into. And then from that goo, it will reform itself into a beautiful flying butterfly. And you can actually see the picture of that butterfly emerging, well, transforming and then emerging from the chrysalis. It's a really incredible process. A four-stage metamorphosis, that's sometimes called a complete metamorphosis, that has all the stages. Metamorphosis is a big word. That means a change, meta is Greek for change, of form, morphosis from the Greek, morph for uh, form. It's a big change of form. And it's one of the more incredible stories to learn about butterflies. The story of how moths grow up is just a tiny bit different. Moths actually make a soft cocoon around their chrysalis. So you can see over here on the moth story that there's actually a chrysalis inside of the cocoon. And then you can see the cocoon versus the chrysalis inside of there. I were videotaping a class. Sorry. <laughs> And this right here is the cocoon that we actually found in the garden here. You should note that the chrysalises and cocoons that we show you here are all empty. <laughs> we wouldn't have put a live animal in there. They were already found when they were empty. If you want to look for butterflies in your yard or now out of the Tissue Botanical Garden as we are reopened, you can bring some binoculars. We think of binoculars more often for birds, but they're actually really helpful for watching butterflies. You wait for them to settle on a plant, you can get an up close look at them with binoculars or pictures with your phone. It can help you start to learn to identify a few types if you want to. And it can be a lot of fun. Now, let's play a couple of butterfly games. The first one we're going to play is one that you can download at home. It's a true false game that you can get from the North Carolina State Parks Year of the Butterfly website. I downloaded these cards and cut them out just like you can. So here's our first question. Can butterflies fly if it's cold? Do you think it's true they can fly if it's cold or not? It's actually true. A butterfly's body temperature is affected by the temperature of its surroundings. If it's too cold, butterflies must warm up their bodies to fly. So they're not exactly free, says true false, but you get what it means. And it's really cool to think about that all these insects make these incredible migrations and transformations while getting all their body heat from external sources. Here's another question. If you touch a butterfly's wing, does it die? Well, maybe. If you rub too many of the protective scales off of the butterfly or moth, it will die. But not always, if you're very, very careful. But you should never do it because it's never a good idea. Here's another question. Do butterflies live on insects and worms? Can they eat insects? What about butterflies that fly in the forest? Well, actually, butterflies 
cannot eat insects or worms. Adult butterflies can only feed on liquids. Remember that big straw-like mouth? How could they eat an insect with that? They can't chew solid foods. They drink through their proboscis, which functions the drinking straw. However, there are a few species of caterpillars, one in North America, that are carnivorous. They eat tiny lathes, though. <laughs> Here's another question. Butterflies usually live just two to four weeks. Is that true? It is true. Though some butterflies can live up to eight months, monarchs and mourning cloaks have a much longer lifespan. Most live just a few short weeks. And during that time, they have to eat and lay more eggs. You might have heard this one. Do butterflies taste with their feet? It's true. Butterfly taste receptors on the butterfly's fleet help it find its host plant and locate more food. You can do the rest of these fun questions online. Butterflies employ all kinds of tricks to keep from being eaten. Is a butterfly's life cycle made up of four parts? If you were paying close attention, you might know that one. And are there no differences between moths and butterflies? You can test yourself by downloading these <laughs> questions. Let's play our second game. This is one that you can play with us. You'll want to look at these different cards and see if you can match the butterfly with the caterpillar. It's a bit tricky. You might know some, but some are really hard to guess. They make such a big transformation from when they're a caterpillar to when they're a butterfly. I'll give you a minute to try and think of some of the answers yourself. All right, now I'll go ahead and start helping you. So I'm pretty sure that I can start off with the monarch. So that's one a lot of people know. There's the caterpillar frozen to the monarch. But now, it gets harder. I think this fuzzy one might be a moth. Oh, but not that moth. Let's see, how about this one? Not that one either. There it is. That was our mislabel. All right, well, excuse that one mistake in our game. <laughs> Another set that matches is these two. That's a woolly bear caterpillar and the Isabel tiger moth. Now the eastern tiger swallowtail is the state butterfly of North Carolina. It can only lay eggs on tulip poplar trees. And it matches this cool looking caterpillar. All right, only two sets left. The Luna Moth has a bright green caterpillar that actually looks like it could be a fur butterfly. Doesn't look as fuzzy as the Wild Moth caterpillar. And the Morning Cloak butterfly, remember that was one of the ones that lives a long time like the Monarch? It looks like this, kind of spiky when it's young. <laughs> Caterpillars are really fun to look for outside, but if you see one that's spiky or fuzzy, has anything odd on it, you should probably not touch it, because there are some that can give you a nasty sting on the hand. Let's come over here and we're going to talk specifically about monarchs, because they are really amazing in the Monarchs are bright and colorful. They spend the summers in the northern part of the U.S., but then they overwinter in northern Mexico and in southern California. That means they have to make a journey of over 3,000 miles. Can you imagine a tiny little insect navigating 3,000 miles away to find the same spot every year? It actually takes three generations to make that trip each way. So the monarchs that return the next year will be six generations descended from the ones that flew down. Monarchs can only lay eggs on milkweed plants. It's a very specific plant that when they eat it, it gives them some toxins. That's how monarchs can be such a bright color and yet not get eaten. If they were not toxic like that, they'd have to camouflage like this, look dull or have scary eye spots to make themselves look bigger and hide their bright colorful colors. But because they're toxic, other animals, other insects and butterflies actually try to mimic monarchs instead so that other things won't eat them. Can you tell which of these is a monarch? 
One is a mark, and one is a fake. This one is the monarch, and this one is the fake. That's called, it's a viceroy. You can see on their bottom wings, you can tell the difference. The viceroy has a line going through the bottom part of the wing. That's how we know which one it is. Here's a real monarch that you can check out. So monarchs make this really incredible journey during their lifetime. They actually have to cross the Gulf of Mexico. The generation of monarchs that cross the Gulf are actually born different. The caterpillars and the butterflies are larger and they're more able to make the journey. How do they know how to do that? To be a whole different size, almost three times as big, just for that third generation? It's kind of a mystery that science is still working on. But we do know a little bit about how monarchs navigate on this really long journey. They have, they navigate by the sun, and they have an internal compass that lets them know where the magnetic field and magnetic north is in the US. But many conservation groups have tried to get monarchs classified as an endangered species. They're in a lot of trouble. In the eastern US, since the 1980s, monarch populations have declined over 80%. And in the western US, it's over 99% decline. And that's very scary for people who love this amazing species. The reason that they've declined so much is a little bit complicated. There's been several factors. The biggest one is that some genetically modified crops were developed, which were resistant to different kinds of herbicides. And that meant that farmer, farmers could spray their fields in herbicide, which would kill off weeds and things around the edges, but help, would protect their crops because it wouldn't kill their crops off anymore. And they actually developed some genetically modified wheat that allowed them to do this. Unfortunately, the edges of those fields, those weeds around the edges, used to include milkweed in a lot of places. And now, without that milkweed to stop over at, the monarchs are in trouble. So, a few of the other things that happened at the same time is farmers started mowing the edges of their fields, and that can be a problem, and climate change has struck insect populations in general across the country and across the world. And so that can be affecting them also. But there are some things that we can actually do to help on our side, as well as butterflies in general. You can plant native flowers and pollinator-friendly flowers in your gardens. You can support monarch wave stations, like the garden, where we can grow milkweed populations. You can buy non-GMO crops, and particularly wheat, and you can avoid the overuse of weed killers in your lawns and where they might get into water and down into other plants, because those weed killers can kill weeds like milkweed, which are actually really important plants that we know that we need. So that's it that I have to teach you today about butterflies, but we really hope you'll join us out at the garden. We are open. You can check out our pollinator stroll. You can look for some real butterflies outside. You can also register for our summer camps, which are coming up. We have a bunch of exciting one-day, three-day, and week-long summer camps, and we posted a separate video about summer camps so you can learn a few of the social distancing methods we've been doing and keeping our class size small. You should register now because we're limiting classes to only eight campers in order to help reduce any possible spread of infection. We're really excited to be able to offer camps, though. Being outside in nature and learning is one of the best things that you can do for your overall health. And we think it'll be a great experience for all of our campers. You can also check out our book, 200 Plus Ways to Explore Nature at Your Home or Outdoors, for some really great ideas about things that you can do at home. And we're going to post a video after this class, which includes some footage of butterflies and caterpillars.